Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and one of the things we enjoy doing most on L'Chaim is introducing you to men and women who are doing important and creative work in the Jewish community and for humanity as a whole. So on this edition of L'Chaim, I am especially pleased to have with me someone I've wanted to meet for a long time, a woman whose work adds information and insight to literally hundreds of thousands of readers through a marvelous website she founded in 2015 and for which she is the editor-in-chief. It's called The Foreign Desk, which every day features the top 10 stories dealing with international news and U.S. foreign policy. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome to L'Chaim and JBS, Lisa Daftari. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, uh, first of all, Mazal Tov on the Foreign Desk. I've told you off camera, I think you do wonderful work and you highlight some of the most important stories, and I receive it every day, and I look forward to it. So for me personally, thank you, Lisa. My pleasure. Thank you for reading. Thank you for being such a loyal supporter and follower of the Foreign Desk. Absolutely. So I want to begin, though, before we talk about some of the issues that you treat on the Foreign Desk, I want to know who in the world you are and how you came to be you know, Lisa Daftari doing this fabulous website. Tell us where you were born and how you were raised and the Jewish family in which, you know, you were nurtured. Sure. Uh, I was born and raised in Bergen County, New Jersey, which is about um, seven miles outside of Manhattan. Um, I was born to um, immigrant Iranian parents. Uh, who my, my father was a study abroad student to New York City and my mother um, came out as well before the revolution, which is a bit more um, unique. Um, a lot of the Iranian immigrants you meet either came out at the beginning of the revolution or after the revolution. Um, but despite the fact that they got out before the revolution, um, so many of my childhood memories were you know, dinner table, table conversations about the politics of the Middle East. Uh, and I wouldn't consider myself or my family you know, especially political or especially, you know, um, keyed into to different things. But these were the kind of the, the socio-political commentary that is had of the, the, the fringe, you know, topics. Um, and because of, this was always in my ear. And, and of course, um, you know, whenever you meet Sephardic Jews, you know, they have such a, a unique position to talk about anti-Semitism, to talk okay. about experiences that they've had. Um, and, you know, I think it's, you know, ironically, you know, you, you'll see Sephardic Jews, although the persecution may have been, you know, more recent than the Holocaust, you'll see them having such a staunch position on um, Zionism and, you know, not being apologetic about their Judaism and not being apologetic about um, their culture. Uh, and I grew up in that kind of a family. I wasn't, you know... Um, uh, very loudly Jewish, but I was very strongly Jewish. You know, it's fascinating to be able to talk to somebody whose parents came out of Iran, and your mother, you said, came out during the revolution. Did I hear you correctly? Before. They both came out before. My father way before, because he was uh, 16 or 17 when he left Iran, um, and came straight to, to the New York area um, to study and, you know, had plans to go back. He was basically a study abroad student. And my mother came back, uh, came out about two years before the revolution. Okay. So the plans were to go back, but... Interesting. You know, we, you know I've talked to, to many Iranian Jews and Sephardic Jews, but specifically Iranian Jews, Lisa. And there tends to be a real commitment to the Jewish tradition and the Jewish people. It is not necessarily observant in the mean, as Ashkenazi Jews mean it, 
but they are very committed. Is that the kind of home you were raised in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when you meet Spartan, as you said, they, they don't have like as much of a label, you know, reform, conservative, uh, orthodox. Yes. But Friday night is a religion. It's, you know, you are at the Shabbat table Friday night, regardless of whether you're going to keep Shabbat or if you're going to go out to a club afterwards. So, you know, I think that there's so many things that, you know, um, that, that Sephardim have, have kept over, you know, generations. And, um, you know, with Ashkenazim, you see a lot of, you know, that history in Europe that the goal was to blend in with their surroundings, whereas Sephardim, when there were minorities in their countries, whether it was Iran or Iraq or Syria or Lebanon, that wasn't their goal. Their goal was to maintain and, and to, you know, not, not, not to assimilate, but not to intermarry or, you know, to, to really maintain um, and pass along Jewish tradition to their children. As you're growing up and you're having these wonderful conversations at the table with your whole family, what are your what are you learning and what is your sense about your parents interest in commitment to the state of israel how was that aspect of life communicated to you yeah it's interesting i didn't grow up particularly persecuted i did have episodes of anti-semitism or even you know racism you know uh, that was you know i don't look particularly jewish so it could be that you know just um, I think everybody has a story that, that because they don't really match their environment and there's bullying going on in school and, and all of that. But that being said, I think the one thing that my parents gave me that was especially important was, um, you know, a strong backbone. And that is, is fortified by facts, by knowledge, by history, by the ability to say, well, I know that this will happen because we had the Iranian revolution and it's so interesting. I was just having this conversation with my mother and I might end up doing an op-ed on it is to tie together what's going on currently in the United States with regards to, you know, the, the, the riots and the protests and black lives matters when you can connect that so well to the experience that so many Iranians had when Khomeini came in and they had the Iranian revolution. Now, again, I don't want, I want to keep it more to my own background, but my, my, parents, um, they had this, this and, I, and I give them so much credit for this, but they were able to strike this balance where we were very much assimilated in the sense that they valued education tremendously. They wanted us to go to the best universities and get educated and rack up those degrees and, you know, all of that, but at the same time, maintain that sense of self, that sense of identity, whether it was Iranian identity or Jewish identity you know, having that, the values, you know, I think you, you, you give your children character, value, virtue, and all of that, you know, the Judaism is embedded in, in all that. You can't really, you know, separate the two. But you didn't speak about Zionism, the extent to which Israel was a word that was used in your home, and whether your parents cared, and then whether as a kid, this was something you knew they cared about. Oh, sure. Um, you know, we had family in Israel, so it was always spoken about as, as this, you know, this tremendous place. And, you know, we, we took many family trips to Israel. I was very fortunate to experience that very early on, um, you know, have, have early memories of being at the Kotel and, you know, closing my eyes tight and praying for whatever I, I, I wanted in life. And, um, you know, it, and, and, and there was an ability to, again, connect that to when you're in bed and, you know, in, in Bergen County and trying to go to sleep and you're saying Shema before you go to bed. So there was definitely this connection of, um, you know, we have Israel. We went to the, um, is, you know, the Israeli Independence Day Parade in Manhattan every year. And my parents were very, very um, you know, they were supportive of Zionist causes. And, and again, more importantly than that is the, the ideas behind that Zionism. It's not just to go to a parade and to wave a flag, but to say that's our homeland and that's what, where we will always be accepted. Um, so you go to a high school where? Frisch. I went to Frisch in, in Paramus, New Jersey. Okay, so you went to a day school in New mm -hmm. Jersey as a teenager. Yes. From there you go to which college? Rutgers University. Rutgers. Um, you know, you mentioned that very often Sephardi Jews or Iranian Jews don't look Jewish. And the, 
I say this carefully because I don't want to be misunderstood. The reality is that there is, there are many, many beautiful people everywhere. And there are many, many beautiful Iranian Jewish women. And in fact, and this is not to either embarrass you or to make a, it's, it's not to make a point of this about you. But you were named one of the 20 hottest women by the Washington Times. <laughs> and it reflects something about not simply you, but the way in which the Iranian people tend to be. And I want to know with whether, as you went through college at Rutgers, whether the fact that you were beautiful and you didn't look Jewish, whether that created any problems for you, <laughs> and oddly enough, did it give you any advantages so that you could see things that perhaps many other Jews at Rutgers, male or female, did not either see or experience? You hit upon the, the uh, pivotal point in which I, I decided to go into this as a career. And why do I say that? I, um, I ended up, you know, I was pre-med for most of college and then I switched to pre-law, you know, like any nice Jewish girl would do. I had great grades all my life. So, you know, I just thought of, of choosing a career that was academically challenging. And then, you know, I, I was very much turned on to, you know, I, I studied the things that I, that I liked because I had so many credits. I finished my requirements for pre-med and pre-law and all of that. So I decided why not do a Spanish major and a Middle Eastern studies major, things that I just enjoy doing. So in my Middle Eastern studies class, it was an intro to the modern Middle East. Um, the entire class, and as you may know, Rutgers University has a tremendously large um, Arab Muslim student population. Yes. In that class, which it's an intro class, so it's a very large class. Um, I was probably the only Jew or one of very few Jews or one of the few Jews that stayed with the class. Many dropped the class because on the first day of class, it's extremely intimidating. The kids who take the class are very much, um, you know, cheerleaders for the pro-Palestinian cause. They're wearing their kafiyas to class um, and they're sitting there like, you know, among each other. So they feel even stronger in, in relaying the, the message. Um, and here I am kind of almost embedded because I look like I would also be, a, you know, a Muslim person from the, the Middle East, regardless of, of, of country of origin. Um, the teacher, knowing this, um, basically decided to fuel things up a bit um, halfway through the semester. And again, I had made many friends in this class because they assumed that I was also Muslim. Um, he, he, he was an atheist and he was very much an academic. He just wanted to stir things up. And we're learning about Israel and the West Bank and all of that. He singled me out and said, Lisa, as a Jew, how do you feel about this? And all of a sudden, you can hear the whispers throughout the classrooms. They're speaking in Arabic. They're, you know, under their breaths. It, it became so hostile towards me. Um, and for the rest of class, I be, it was like one against the masses. I was defending the position of Israel in, in this class. And I remember so clearly coming back. I mean, this is kind of a time before people decided to become pundits or become, you know, a, a voice or a leader in, the, in this arena. Um, I remember coming back and telling my roommate at the time that I wish I could just, you know, have a career where I could just speak about this stuff because it's so rewarding to be able to use, whether it's your exterior, interior, your words, your childhood, everything you've learned to stand up for and be a spokesperson for a cause that you believe so strongly in. And that's exactly how this was born. You know, it's a, it's a manifestation of, 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 of that class specifically. So since then, um, you know, I, I was a, a contributor on Fox News for about seven years. And again, using, like you said, it's, it's because I, I am Sephardic and I, you, you tend to <laughs> look the part where you, you feel more in a position um, qualified to speak about a topic. Uh, and I know many, many Jews, non-Jews, Christians, you know, blonde hair, blue eyed, males, females, whatever it may be, that have a ton of knowledge in this arena. But, you know, when you're from the area, when you speak the languages, when you've traveled, you know, I traveled to Syria, I traveled um, throughout the Middle East, throughout Jordan, and um, on the border of Lebanon, and I went to the UN camps, and and, and it's because that, you know, you have a darker coloring that you can 
fit in and you can interview people. And you know, it's all only been an advantage. You know, I, um, I look at the, the Me Too movements across the United States and it's, you know, always a problem. You never want anybody to feel um, marginalized for their gender, for their race, for anything. But I also look at, you know, the, the unique position that many females are in to use whether it's their sensitivity or their perspective, their, their understanding of emotion, their understanding of psychology. And in my case, it was this understanding of a cultural background that really was a leg up in, in many ways for me in my career. It's interesting. Your story gave me chills. At any point in the class, when the teacher says, points out that you're a Jew, and all of a sudden your classmates who who were your friends a moment ago are now whispering in Arabic about you and you, everything changes for you. Did you ever think of leaving the class yourself? Never. I was scared for, for a brief moment, but then, you know, you get this feeling that this is, this is why I was put in this position. And I've always felt that way in my career. There's so many people doing this, you know, wonderful work advocating for Israel, advocating for human rights. And I do all of that. You know, my platform is not just about Israel, but when I do talk about even other parts of the Middle East, or I talk about Christian persecution, or I talk about the Kurds, you know, it's all important work to talk about human rights. It's, it's Kiddush Hashem in, in all of it. Um, and I, at that moment, and maybe that's why my career was born out of these moments that I, that I'm illustrating is because, you know, you feel like I've, I'm given such a unique position. I need, I need to be here. This is why I'm here. This is why every single episode in my life, whether it was a dinner table conversation, or if it was being bullied, or if it was going to Israel and praying at the hotel, all of these things came together for a reason. If I'm here, then this is my job and I need to be the advocate. Well, you gave me chills again. I love the story and I love your perspective. And just one last question about your time at Rutgers. Were there other experiences similar to that? Or, or was that not only a formative moment for you, but a unique? It was the only time you had to deal with that kind of issue. You know, fast forward to leaving Rutgers and having this career, you know, I was at NBC for a, a while. I was at, worked at a few think tanks. I did reports for the Pentagon. I was at Fox News and then I have my own platform now. Fast forward to last fall, um, October of 18, um, a, a little over a year ago where I was invited by the chancellor of the school at Rutgers to give a talk, um, you know, on a topic of my choosing. And, you know, what an honor to be invited back to your alma mater. And, you know, um, it was wonderful. I, I, we, we put down the date, you know, for six months in advance, maybe even more excited to do the talk. I threw it right back at them because I was maybe busy or I thought maybe they, they know the climate on campus better. And I said, you know what, I'm open to any topic of your choosing. And they chose the topic of freedom of speech on campus. I was very happy to do the talk. We decided, we, you know, I gave the bullet points. They put out flyers. The Monday before I was supposed to fly out to speak at Rutgers, I get a call by the same chancellor who happened to have been my professor while I was at Rutgers. Um, you know, and when he reached out to me, he said, I remember you as one of two or three students who I thought were the most brilliant students I ever had. I'm only telling you this to, to illustrate my point. He said to me, there's, been, there's a Pakistani student who's the head of the Muslim Students Organization he started a petition to not have you come to campus and he's calling you an Islamophobe. And I, I just was stunned. And I said to him, professor, go look at my track record. They invite me to speak at the UN on topics of the Middle East. They've had me talk about Christian persecution. They have me talk about women's rights. They have me talk about the situation in Syria. And this student is calling me an Islamophobe on what grounds? And he sent me a quote that he picked up from a talk I gave at a think tank years before. Totally distorted. Some, uh, a very young man who did an article on this, on, on, on Rutgers disinviting me basically from the talk, um, went and found the audio, and I didn't know that there even was, the audio recording of this talk that I gave, and it was in 2015, and they totally butchered the quote in order to make their point um, that I'm an Islamophobe. And the what quote that you, I had said- What, what did quote, you say? Right. So the quote was, someone in the audience asked me if um, ISIS, in fact, um, is based on tenets of the Quran. Um, and I said, they, yes, they claim to uh, 
take their, take their um, inspiration from the tenets of the Quran. So what they did was they took out the part where I said they claim to. And I said, they, they quoted me as saying, ISIS takes its tenets from the Quran. So I'm an Islamophobe. So this turned out to be such a huge production. It was covered by you know many, many uh, publications. I was on uh, the Fox Ford and a few other news outlets. And um, it ended up that, that the same professor called me and said, look, I'm just worried about security, safety. I know these kids are gonna show up and it's not gonna be pretty. Um, and I said, okay, but you know, if media comes to me, I have to tell them the truth about what happened. So basically that's exactly how it played out. And then the school put out another, it looked really bad on the school. So they put out another statement saying this was a misunderstanding that they only postponed and they look forward to having me back on campus. And they wanted my you know, reaction to that to set a date. And I said, too little, too late, you know? And it was really upsetting because this wasn't a Jewish organization or a Republican or Democrat organization. It wasn't a student organization. This was the chancellor of the school who extended the invite, who came up with, ironically, the topic, which was freedom of speech, which they shut down. Um, so, you know, it, it went full circle. And I said, wow, you know, they, they created this, 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 this platform for me in a way. They inspired the, the platform that I have right now. And they shut it down at the same time. So we've come a long way with regards to freedom of speech, shutting down freedom of speech, and um, hearing an opposite viewpoint. I want you now to talk about that in a larger context. Because of the work you've done and the commitment I believe you've had throughout your entire life, from the time you were sitting at your parents' table, to free speech, talk to me for one moment about how you perceive the current American mood and especially the ethic on college campuses where there is an effort now to clamp down on what is called, Lisa, hate speech. And the way in which freedom of speech, which is something, you know, I grew up, a long time, I'm much older than you, I grew up, there was nothing more important to my parents and to me growing up than the American commitment to freedom of speech and what it meant in, for the good of American Jewry. And at times it was, you know, the right that was not allowing liberals to speak and we as young liberals and as committed Americans, we argued that there should be the right of free speech. And now it seems as if there are factions on the left of America who want to limit free speech, but they do it on the basis of a concept that they are limiting hate speech, whether it's online and it could one day affect the foreign desk or whether it's on college campuses, as the story you just described to us. So I'm asking you now, as a professional, what's your take on the concept of free speech as it is being presented today in America, which very often talks about limiting hate speech? Right, and what's the litmus test for hate speech? It, it emotionally ruffles the wrong feathers. And you know what's what's crazy about this? Uh, you know, when they shut down hate speech, I used to do undercover reporting on college campuses about hate speech and about you know uh, student organizations that used to bring in. And, and I'm not exaggerating. I've heard this myself. I would record these these talks um, to bring in jihadis, basically um, individuals who come to campus, and this is all throughout the UC system, and it, you know, you can go look this up, UC Irvine, for example, I remember going to a talk where um, it was a black imam who was um, converted in prison, and he came out in the middle of campus, this beautiful campus, he would be on the microphone saying that we should launch jihad on Americans. And this was taxpayer money because it was a UC system school, this is, you know, and, and I would always say this to everyone, I'm not worried about the 
Arab Muslim students or the Pakistani students who would gather there. I'm worried about John Smith and Susie Smith who pass by and don't know anything about anything. And they quickly latch on to this cause that they believe is so great. Um, and, you know, that's okay. But then, you know, if you know, my talk, for example, was shut down because I'm an Islamophobe. So it only has become a system of who can scream the loudest, who can be the most offended, who can be, you know, who, whose emotions are, are highest, who's the most dramatic. And in the case of a lot of these organizations, they, they take advantage of the intersectionality. They all buddy up and they shut down speech that, is, that they don't agree with. And that is their litmus test for, for hate speech. Now, you tell me what these organizations have to do with one another. For example, you have the Women's March. Why do we have an individual who is so hate-filled, like Linda Sarsour, embedding herself within the Women's March to also bring in the anti-Israel cause? Why do we have, you know, again, the pro-Palestinian cause or the anti-Israel cause embedding itself with Black Lives Matter and then, you know, so what happens is that these young people who are low information, high emotion, they take upon themselves the, a, a very virtuous cause, like advocating for black rights, wonderful. Advocating for women's rights, wonderful. Advocating for you know, equality, great. All of these are wonderful causes, but they're not pure causes because they have been hijacked by these individuals who know exactly how to piggyback onto these causes to get very innocent Americans to take on their um, to take on their advocacy, and it's working, and it's working, and you can see it all over college campuses. You can see them the current Black Lives Matters movement. You can see it in the in the in the the one that bothers me the most, Gay Pride Parade. You have an anti-Israel element to it. Guess where the only place in the Middle East so they have a. a, a gay pride parade is in Israel. So do you know do your research before you go out there and you support these causes. You know, and to stand back and to, to even have a shred of criticism about the current Black Lives Matter movement, to say that it is tainted is it comes across as racist. It comes across as you know a, a, as as not being the person who advocates for equality at this very, very critical time. So you know I think it's political correctness, it's the intersectionality. Um, it's the ability of these groups to take advantage and pull on the heartstrings of Americans who are, you know, are, are, are looking to support these human causes. Well, I hope it never spills on to the foreign desk or you personally, but I am very, very worried about the notion that major website figures and, you know, platforms like Twitter or Google or Facebook would ever have the right to say that something I said or something you said or something anyone says doesn't have a right to be on Twitter or right. Facebook. And you should know, by the way, YouTube took one of our programs down and it was a totally innocent program in which I talked about what it means to be a liberal Zionist Jew today. Mm. But it had the word Zionist in the title. And there were evidently there were people who were offended by the word Zionist. And YouTube took down a JBS program. Now, there were protests immediately and they put it back up. But I've now been touched by this. And Lisa, it frightens me very much for America. And I was wondering whether in any way you share my fright. Sure. You know, I'm, I, I don't directly feel that because I've always fought against, you know, um, a lot of popular opinion because, you know, at, as soon as you take a position on Israel, not, you know, there's no position on Syria. Of course, everybody wants, you know, the good guys to win and the bad guys to lose. There's no position on Venezuela, there's no position on any of these other hotspots, but there is a definite and very heated position that you know one has to take on on Israel. And currently, this wasn't the case in the 50s, or the, you know, this wasn't the case in, in, in even in my lifetime. It's only become the case in the past decade or so. Is that you know, the, 
people who are pro-Israel have a very hard time being accepted by a lot of the left's movements. I have friends who are very much involved in the women's movement, and they separated themselves as soon as there was this anti-Israel element. They were promised by the organiz organizers of the march that they would try to eliminate these influences, and they did not. They went back on their word. Um, same thing goes for a lot of you know, you know, other causes, I can, the list is, is very long. Um, and I've always said this, and you know, it, this is, this could not be more true than the current moment. You know, for Israelis, for Jews, the, the, their blessing and curse has always been the same, and it's been their res resilience. And, you know, Jews left Germany, they left Iraq, they left Iran, they left Syria in order to build and to grow and to move on. They didn't victimize they didn't say, woe is on to me, and I, you know, now we need to collect. They didn't do any of that. They wanted to grow and build from it. And the same thing goes now for you know, Jews in Europe, in the United States, wherever they're being um, marginalized. They don't look at themselves as a minority. You know, Jews are a minority with a majority mentality. They're always looking to support other causes. They're always looking to, you know, to do beyond their family and community and their, even their Jewish community. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big, um, it means a lot to most Jews to help out with other causes, not just the Jewish ones. But you don't see that in, 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 in these other groups and their, and, and their causes. So again, the blessing for, 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 for Israel, for the Jewish community, is that they're not victims and they don't stand there and say, wait, wait a minute, you know, we're the ones in the minority. That's why you don't see the outbursts when the New York Times butchers the headline or, or puts up a photoshopped photo by Hamas or Hezbollah. You just don't see it because Jews have not been, they haven't, generation to generation, they haven't been enraged and they haven't protested and they never said, you know, look at us, we're, we're, we're the ones who should be pitied. Um, and because of that, I think that, that, that now they're having a difficult time saying, wait a minute, just because we didn't, we didn't demand this doesn't mean that our rights can be trampled when we are part of a bigger issue like the women's rights, like Black Lives Matters, et cetera. So I think that it's very important um, you know, to, to root out these elements of anti-Semitism in these other you know, social justice issues. Yeah. At the Lisa, what's your political perspective in general? Do you consider yourself to be leaning right? <laughs> um, I'll tell you this much. My priorities in, 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 in life, um, you know, I think it's about, obviously our, our human rights are, are, are extremely important, but I think that um, my priorities or what I vote on are the economy and national security. If those two things are not in place, everything else is out the window. I don't vote on abortion. I don't vote on, um, you know, on gay rights. I don't vote on gun rights. I don't vote on, on these fringe issues. Um, again, I, my priorities are national security, as you can tell by the work that I do in my life, and of course the economy, because if we, we can't sustain ourselves then, and because of that, I find myself to, to lean right. This wasn't always the case with my, my family. You know, after 9-11, I think we took a, a good look at America and said, this is, a, this is the line in the sand, and things are going to be very different here on forward. Um, you know, I, I grew up, again, in, in, around New York City, and now I'm living in Los Angeles, so, you know, with the social issues, you know, I, I, can, I can understand a, a, a larger um, spectrum of ideas, um, but with regards to the things that are important to me, I, I find that the left has done so much damage um, that's not repairable in the next term or the term after that. I think it's damage that they continue to do. Um, I love this country. I am a first generation American, but I truly love this country. It's almost faux pas these days for someone, um, you know, in my age bracket to say that without cringing or thinking that we're bad or thinking that America can do better. You know, that, that term has always been so odd to me. We can do better. Of course we can do better, but what does that even mean? Why can't we stop and say this is still the best place in the world to live uh, and to, you know, respect America and its policies, its, its underlying policies, meaning what the founders of this country created and how it has been, regardless of who's in office, regardless of whether it's President Obama or President Trump, if you agree with them, if you don't agree with them, you know, where is that ability to live under any president and say, well, if this wasn't the one that I voted for, I can still respect and live 
because the, the main tenets that the, the Constitution's not going to change, you know, um, our freedoms are not going to change. We live under the American flag. And you know what? Next time around, maybe my man or woman will win the presidency. But for now, you know, and that, that's what's been lost. And I think that um, it's doing more damage than, you know, President Trump's in office right now. The damage that's being done by the media and by those who oppose him with regards to everything, including Israel and the policies, will far, far outlive um, this presidency and the next one and the one after that. We're, we're doing damage that is, is going to be long lasting and will damage all Americans, not just Washington. You know, you're associated with Fox and Fox is thought to be, you know, on the, in the Jewish community, Fox is like you know, part of the bad guys. And in general, the Jewish Depends community- Depends who you ask. It, well, sorry? Depends who you ask. There are many, many Jews who find Fox to be their only- Absolutely, absolutely. But, and look, and there are many, many Jews who appreciate what Donald Trump has done for the state of Israel, and not only for the state of Israel, but what Donald Trump has done for America. And many Jews even who, you know, they're really, they have no, <laughs> No love for his style or some yeah. of the things he says. They have enormous respect for the accomplishments of his administration over the first, first three plus years of his presidency. But they're the minority in the Jewish community. 75 to 80 percent of American Jews, certainly 70 percent of American Jews are very loyal to the Democratic Party. And they argue, they would see themselves as leaning left. And they watch MSNBC and they watch CNN. And they tend to even look down on somebody who watches Fox. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering whether in your travels throughout the Jewish community, you take heat for the fact <laughs> that you are, I mean, you know, Alan yeah. Dershowitz, who is mm -hmm. the quintessential American Jewish liberal, yes. civil libertarian, legal constitutional scholar. You, you don't like the fact that he was part of the OJ case? Fine. You think he likes the limelight too much? He's not the only one. But all of a sudden, he's persona non grata. And one of the reasons why is he now is on Fox. Now, he'll tell you Fox is the only channel now that invites him on. Right. But that's the image Fox has right. among many, including many who many Jews who live in Los Angeles. And right. I just was curious to know whether you have received, you've experienced any kind of, you know, negative stuff yes. because you're on Fox or associated with Fox. Yes, it's many times I'll, I'll even get, you know, the, the backhanded compliment, but you're so good. Why Fox? Um, and you know what, to your comments, I always say to these individuals, you know, you're loyal to the Democratic Party, as you said, many of them are, but it's the Democratic Party, have, have they been loyal to these Jews? Have they done right by these Jews? In the last hour of President Obama's presidency, he did everything he could to throw Jews, Israel, under the bus, and it didn't change their positioning one iota. Not, I'm not saying they need to change their political checkbox from Democrats to Republican or to independent. No, by, by no means do I mean that. But call it out. If you're loyal to a party and you're an integral part of that party, whether you're donating to the Obama campaign or you're donating to Hillary Clinton's campaign or you're donating to AOC's campaign, demand, demand that they do not trample the rights of Jews, that they stand behind anti-Semitism, anti that, they, that they stand behind um, you know, Israel and, and, and its sovereignty, you know, what, what Trump's done, and I, I want to definitely go back to what you said and say, look, I wouldn't hire President Trump to write Hallmark cards. It is no secret that this man should, should, should get, you know, or listen to his communications people and to speak better, all of that. But let's look at the results. Look at how many anti-Semitism bills this man has signed. Let's look at the rollout of the Palestinian peace deal. I was invited to the White House and I was part of, of, of a team of, of uh, journalists, a handful, just a round table of us, 
that were told about the, the, the rollout, that were told about the, the details of this, that the Palestinians didn't even look at. They didn't even look at. What did President Obama do for the Jewish community? Um, you know, it, I should say, what did he do against, um, you know, Israel and the Jewish community? And when people try to separate Israel from from Jews or Judaism, and to say, well, if he was anti-Israel because he had a personal beef with Netanyahu, and it wasn't that, and it wasn't this, and it wasn't that. Look, we are too small of a minority to parse these details and to be that vulnerable to a political system like that of Washington. We have APAC for a reason, and APAC walks on eggshells. Why? Because they want to keep the left and the right, and they know how difficult and how challenging it's become to keep the left uh, coming to APAC. They, all of the presidential nominees, they refuse to even come to APAC. This would have never been the case uh, 10, 15 years ago. So my point being, you know, if you're a Democrat, that's fine, but understand your priorities. Don't settle for an anti-Israel platform just because you identify with the color blue. We deserve more. We deserve more. The Jews are such a, an integral part of this country, regardless of if you're reform or conservative or orthodox, if you're blue or red, if you're Sephardi or Ashkenazi, we deserve more. And you know what? I think that a lot of people have given up on that. I see a lot of Jews on, on Facebook because they are so anti-Trump, you know, throw away the baby with the bathwater, as they say. You know, his policies are good, and there's no two ways about it. His policies regarding Israel are good. His, his policies regarding the, the Middle East are, are good. They are, it, it behooves us to at least support these um, policies and not to be just, the, you know, a, a, just not to vote by color, but to look at the issues, look at the policies, and to educate ourselves better. Again, we, we are in such a small minority that we just we can't afford to, to really put our guards down. You said earlier that the issues that motivate you or that, you, that are the priority for you. Uh, it's foreign policy and the economy, and that you do not vote when it comes to a presidential election on social issues like abortion. Is Israel, not foreign policy, but Israel itself is a candidate or parties stand on Israel in some way a determinative issue when you go into the polls to vote for a president of the United States? Like indirectly, when I say national security, you know, it, it all ties back to Iran and Israel, and it always has. And um, I, I say this not because those are the two countries that I have any affiliation with in the Middle East, but because if, if you don't have the cash cow of Iran fueling uh, the terrorists in the Middle East, then you don't have the problem for Israel. You don't have a problem for any of those countries. What's ironic about you know, the modern Middle East or even looking at national security in, in, since 2014 or a bit before that, the reason I say 2014 is when this country became you know, awakened by the, the ISIS and all of a sudden it was such an issue. All right, ISIS was an issue, but it's a smaller issue in comparison to the, the terrorism cash cow that is in Iran. They're supporting Hezbollah. They're supporting them in South America, in Venezuela, in Bolivia, in Chile. They have set up basically these cultural centers that are run by Hezbollah operatives right at the footstep of the United States. And people don't talk about this um, or anywhere else. And, and my point being that when you know, when, when you have a, a, a terrorist attack here in the United States, everyone can condemn it as bad. When you have a Christian girl killed in Egypt as she's walking home from school, which I covered this story, 14 years old, she got murdered by terrorists very bad. When you have you know, a young Syrian boy being washed up at the shore because he was abandoned by terrorists, again, because his family was taken, that's very bad. We can all agree on this. But when a 13-year-old girl is stabbed to death by a terrorist in her bed, in her own house, all of a sudden people have to think of in Israel, People have to think about whether that's bad or it's good. Do I, mm, maybe, maybe Israelis deserve it. Terrorism is bad. And that is, that's national security to me. So if I vote on national security, it's because I want to eradicate it from the face of the earth. It, it, we can't pick and choose which terrorists are good and which terrorists are bad. If you stand against terrorism, then you stand in support of Israel. It's as easy as that. Why is it that, you know, I have a lot of followers from Iran. And if I post this story about this Egyptian girl that was killed, again, about the same age, um, and, and all of them were, you know, put up emojis and whatever else, comments on my Facebook 
The following week, that 13-year-old girl was stabbed in her bed in Israel. All of a sudden, silence from so many of my followers on Facebook. We can't pick and choose. Fast. We cannot pick and choose. By the way, how, Lisa, did you come to create the Foreign Desk? And also, who funds you? Okay, so um, the Foreign Desk um, came to be um, when I was still at Fox News. And um, the number of stories that we were getting up on Fox, written and 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 broadcast um, were very small in comparison to all the stories that were out there, but it makes perfect sense because you know it's a large news platform. Not everybody is interested in all the nuances that take place in the Middle East. So this basically was an overflow site for all the stories that I was coming across and writing, um, but didn't have a home. So either they were going on Fox or if they weren't, then they were put on this. And um, the morning email was a you know a way to get in touch and engage with all of the followers that I have. Um, this, the, the email that I do, it's a top 10, and it not only goes to you know, soccer moms and people who are interested in the news, but um, we have members of the CIA, FBI, almost every news executive of the major news uh, channels follows it. Um, a, a lot of important people, whether in their Washington or in roundabouts, read this and are informed by it and their opinions and their lawmaking and, and, and their news um, agenda for the day is shaped by it. So it's very important to me to put these stories out. Um, it's basically a curation of the top 10 stories, whether it's anti-Semitism or terrorism or, or foreign policy here in the United States. Um, so I put that out for free every morning and that's become you know, our, our main job. We fund ourselves based on grants and sponsorships. So um, we basically are, are, you know, open to people who want to sponsor videos or sponsor um, the, the morning email and things like that. So we have readers on both sides of the pol political aisle. The morning email is it just headline, so um, it's not, you know, it, it's, it, it doesn't have a political uh, slant whatsoever. Um, but of course, we are a pro-Israel organization. Um, and, you know, we are an anti-terrorism organization, like that needs to be said. Um, but, you know, it's, um, it, it's really, this project has meant so much to me because it's brought together so many people, people from so many different sides um, to, to pay attention to uh, human rights stories, to pay attention to the Yazidis, to be, pay attention to the Kurds, um, to pay attention to a lot of these groups that weren't getting the attention that they needed. Uh, and again, this was born right around that time, 2014, 15, when the world wasn't paying attention to the Assyrians and the Yazidis and all the others who I was able to bring to the UN or bring to Fox or, you know, give them a platform on the foreign desk. So that's how we've come to, to grow this organization. Well, good for you. And again, yes. as I said, I receive it every day and it just alerts you to some of the issues that you might not see. And it raises some very interesting points on matters that I know you, our audience, care about. So I'm recommending the Foreign Desk to you. Uh, I want to come back now to something you said earlier, and I just want your take on that as well. There are many well-meaning, committed Jews who are also, they want the state of Israel to thrive. They do not want an end to the state of Israel. But they see Israel as the problem. They mm -hmm. see settlements as the problem. They see Netanyahu as the problem. They see the way in which they feel Israel is treating the Palestinians on the West Bank or in Gaza. And they are willing to really take stands against the state of Israel to the point of saying that, yes, they think it was wrong to defund the Palestinian Authority, even though the Palestinian Authority is using American money for pay for slay. Why do you think it is that so many, and I'm going to say it again, well-meaning ethical, committed Jews who support Israel still see Israel as the problem in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Yeah, they, you know, this is a position of appeasement. And, you know, unfortunately, these individuals, as you said, very well-meaning, they don't have the facts. They just don't have the facts. 
Ask Gazans, ask people in the West Bank. Many of them, not the brainwashed ones, not the ones who are sending their kids out to throw rocks at Israeli soldiers, many of them blame Hamas as the reason why they're being kept down, why victimhood serves them, and why the money that is given to the Palestinian Authority is paid for weapons and is paid for paid to slay uh, and, and is not used for the Palestinian people. Um, if you've traveled to that part of the world, if you've spoken with any of these people before, I did an article for Fox News in 2014 about this, about Gazans being more upset. I did interviews with so many Gazans. This was during um, Operation Protective Edge, where so many of them said, we're more mad at Gaza than, I mean, I'm more mad at Hamas for not taking care of us and protecting us than we are at Israel currently lobbing missiles at us. And there's a lot of people with this opinion. It's not just the few that I, that I interviewed for the piece. I got death threats for this piece. I was put on the Hamas hit list for this piece. But it tells an important story. You know, and I know that people are upset with Bibi Netanyahu. Maybe he can be compared to Trump in a lot of ways um, for being so hawkish in, in certain ways. But there's a reason why he keeps getting elected or almost elected in this case. But it's because he is so strong on national security. And that's exactly what Israel needs. We're not in a position to be vulnerable. We're not in a position of appeasement. Look, for, the, for, for, for logical, normal-minded individuals, whether it's in the United States or in, in, in uh, Israel, when you let down your guard, when you look the other way because you think that terrorist attack just happened, but I'm going to go back to business as usual tomorrow, that's fine. But guess where that terrorist and his family are going? Back to plot another attack. And that's a reality. This is not Islamophobia. This is not an anti-Palestinian talking point. It's a reality because that's what they've been taught. That's what behooves them. When they teach children in their math books about if I kill two Jews today and two tomorrow, how many have I killed? When they hide weapons and they use those children as shields, when they bring their schools into harm's way, basically in the line of fire, how, how do they, how, how can you, how can you say that, you know, the, 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 the argument between Israel and the Palestinians is like putting, you know, calculus students and kindergartners in the same classroom and saying, we need to make peace together. They're entirely living two different realities. I want you to answer this. There are Jews who stand over it and say, there are Palestinians who really want to make peace with Israel sure. and are willing to live, would be willing to live with Israel like Canada lives with the United States. Sure. And that it's Israel's responsibility to find those Palestinians, to nurture those Palestinians, and to protect those Palestinians. Do you think it's true that there are many Palestinian intellectuals who, if they were if they felt they were protected, they would criticize Abbas for not meeting with Netanyahu, or they would criticize the PA and Hamas for not giving up the jihad, and they would be in favor of living alongside Israel in peace. Are there these Palestinian intellectuals, and if there are, do you feel Israel is remiss in not promoting them? And most American Jews don't know about them. Yes. I'm asking you because I don't know that that charge is true. Yes. I want to know your sense of it. Sure. I know for a fact that that is true. Um, I've written about them. I've talked to them. I know that they exist. And the issue is that they cannot be protected. They, you know, I wrote about them very anonymously. Extre you know, all details were changed in order to not risk their lives. And still, I was put on the Hamas hit list. I'm sure those individuals, had I given an iota of detail about their, their, their personal information, they would be put on a hit list and, and taken out. The issue, they live in a mafia society. They live in a, in a terrorist society. They cannot freely speak out. Their ideas cannot be heard. And I will add one other point. You know, the Palestinian people, they're being taken advantage of. This victimhood, it, it, it behooves them. Again, it behooves Hamas, the Palestinian Authority, to keep the people down because they use them as pawns in order to make their case. If they truly wanted to emancipate, if they wanted to 
grow the Palestinian people. If you go to Gaza, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. Build it up. Build it up. Do more for the people so that they can move forward instead of throwing rocks and becoming suicide bombers. The real influences that are pro, even on campus, you know, the real influences that are the pro-Palestinian cause that want to do damage to Israel don't come from the Palestinian people. They come from outside. They come from the besieged forces. They come from extremists that live outside. They come from, you know, all, even on campus when you do this, how many Palestinian students show up? Very few. You have students coming from other backgrounds. A lot of Pakistani students show up. A lot of Afghani students show up. You have all sorts of, of, of students showing up. We don't see that many Palestinian students. They want peace. They do. They truly want peace. And I'm talking about, you know, the majority of people who want to move forward. We're living in a day and age where they don't want to be given a rock to throw. They want to be given an iPad. And because of that, that's where you need to make the shift. And we can, we, we can, we have a moment where we can take it, you know, use the opportunity to give them a better future. And that is until the Palestinians, the, the leadership want to give their people a better future, Israel has no way of doing that. And, you know, I'll add to this, the peace deal that Jared Kushner and the White House rolled out, if you have read any of its details, that initial phase, which is an economic phase, is a gift given on a silver platter to the Palestinian people if, if their goal is to have peace, to grow economically, to have a better future, to give the people a better future, and they turned it down without looking at it, which tells you that they don't want any of that for the Palestinian people. You know, Lisa, you are fabulous. And I knew I was going to fall in love with you. <laughs> I am thrilled to be able to introduce you to the L'Chaim audience and JBS audience. I hope if, they, if there are people who have not yet gone to the, your website and you know, make sure every day they get the foreign desk I hope after seeing you on L'Chaim, they will do so. I only have a million more questions for you, so I will only let you go if you promise to come back. In the meantime, continued success with everything you're doing. Kol tu v'hatzlacha. Lisa, thank you very, very much for thank giving you. us time on L'Chaim and JBS. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Lisa Daftari, founder and editor-in-chief of the website the Foreign Desk, I hope you see it and you receive it every day. You'll be doing yourself an enormous favor. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the things said on this edition of L'Chaim. Please email me at rabbigolub at jbstv.org. And if you want to be in touch with Lisa yourself, email me and we'll pass your emails on to her. Remember, also, you can now take L'Chaim anywhere you go by downloading the L'Chaim podcast. Take it with you, listen to this L'Chaim interview conversation again, or any of the other wonderful people we've had on L'Chaim. And so until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends, to life. L'Chaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.